now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Gerald Moore starring in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. This episode goes back to August 27, 1949, the story of The Eager Witness. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This started with a man on trial for his life and an A1 citizen eager to testify. But there it was interrupted. And it wasn't until I found a corpse in a bubbling bath, gunplay in the woods, and lots of blackmail that the real eager witness had a chance to talk. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Eager Witness. Division 88 of the Superior Court of the State of California and for the County of Los Angeles now in session. The Honorable Albert Winston, judge presiding. Everybody rise. It was the case of the people versus the oft-arrested, never convicted, smooth Earl Jernigan, sometimes bookie, charged in the first degree with a month-old killing of a kindly, gray-haired horse trainer named Kurt Hopper, who had once almost been my client. It was the afternoon of the fourth day of the trial, and the prosecutor for the state had already built an almost airtight case against the alleged gambler when my turn finally came. To further substantiate the state's claim that Earl Jernigan did willfully and with malice aforethought Take the life of the deceased Kurt Harper. <laughs> Will Mr. Philip Marlowe take the stand? <laughs> Raise your right hand. <laughs> Promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you, God. I do. State your name and occupation. Philip Marlowe, private detective. Take the stand. <laughs> Mr. Marlowe, on the morning of the 30th day of July last, the day on which the late Kurt Harper was murdered, were you hired as a private detective by the said Mr. Harper? I was. And at that time, Mr. Marlowe, did Mr. Harper state his reason for hiring you? He did. He wanted me to act as his personal bodyguard on the following day when he planned to drive to San Francisco. Did he say why he needed a personal bodyguard? He did. He told me he was afraid for his life, that he refused the gambler's demand that he drug a certain racehorse a week earlier, that that gambler had threatened to kill him. I see. Now, Mr. Marlowe, did Mr. Harper name that gambler? Yes, he did. Who was it? Earl Jernigan. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Counsel for the defense. Counsel for the defense waves cross-examination, Your Honor. The witness is excused. Didn't make sense. No cross-examination. Because from the opening adjective, the counsel for the defense, a dapper item named Calder, who always appeared in French cuffs, gray gabardine, and a cocky, uninviting smile had raved, ranted, Your and practically Honor, spit at each witness the state had presented. The so the courtroom was left with a tingling impression that Earl Jernigan's attorney had something of a surprise waiting up his legal sleeve. Later, when Calder was on his feet and addressing the jury, now, that something started out fast. Now that the state has taken the trouble to offer so much circumstantial evidence, so much hearsay, rumor, conjecture, now will I smash all of that with the testimony of one man. One man known to all of you as an outstanding citizen of this city. A prominent real estate broker. An unimpeachable witness eager to testify. Mr. Leonard Gaines. It worked. Landed in each and every lap like a live grenade and exploded all the way around at once. And when the eminent Mr. Gaines, gray at the temples, maybe 45, a neat and expensive midnight blue flannel with giant stick pin to match, took the stand. And in his own meeting of the board, tone of voice told the court that Earl Jernigan had spent the entire day and night of July 30th last with him at his Malibu Beach home. Now, the prosecuting attorney's jaw dropped to his chest and he stared dumb. Day or night did Mr. Jernigan ever leave my home. And as for the hour of the murder, eight o'clock in the evening, we were having dinner. 
After that, we played gin rummy until... Oh, until midnight. Are you sure of that, Mr. Gaines? The hour of your dinner, I mean. I am positive, Mr. Calder. No, you can't oh, be! Oh, you can't! Quiet, quiet, order! Miss Harper, order in the court, please! Oh, I won't be quiet! I won't anymore! Miss Harper, quiet, order, order! This court is adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Another scotch and soda, mister? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, wait a minute, baby. I think I'm going to have company. Mr. Marlowe, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm... Gail Harper, yeah, I know. <laughs> what I don't know is why you're not doing 30 days on a rock pile for that rumpus you just kicked up in court. Would you like a soft drink? No, thanks. All right, just one, baby. Jack. The judge said he understood and left me off with a short lecture, which was what I accounted on. Oh. You mean all that fireworks in there was planned, not just spontaneous combustion? That's right. I had a half time. <laughs> Look, Mr. Marlowe, will you work for me? Oh, well, now, look, will baby... Will you help I... me prove that Mr. Leonard Gaines is a liar and that Earl Jernigan did kill my father? Now, take it easy, Gail. It's a big mouthful, you know. Mr. I... Marlowe, listen, please. There isn't much time. we got to prove this tonight or never. By noon tomorrow with the outside, the case will go to the jury. Okay, what do you want me to do? Take over where I left off. But first, let's get out of here. All right. And never mind that drink, miss. Where do we start, honey? With Leonard Gaines' ex-wife, Debbie Jansen. Here's a snapshot of her. Mm. They were divorced about six months ago, Mr. Marlowe, and she wasn't very happy about it. No, huh? Made you figure she was your in? Yes, and I was right. <clears throat> Mr. Marlowe, it took eavesdropping, bribery, second story work, but I found out plenty. I'll bet you did. Like what? Oh, hold it, Gail. Lights red. Like the fact that Debbie and a guy called Eugene Mowry are putting a bite on Gaines for $20,000. Mm. Blackmail, Mr. Marlowe, with the payoff schedule to be made sometime tonight. Right now, she's staying at the Sun and Sulphur Springs Lodge out in the valley. Gaines used to go there once in a while for his arthritis. And the why of the whole business is a letter Gaines once wrote to his ex-wife. No fooling. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, tell me, what's that to do with Jernigan's trial and Gaines being a... Oh, it's green now. I think there's a connection, because yesterday I overheard Debbie tell this Maui something about Gaines' scheduled appearance at the trial today, and... Yeah. <gasps> oh, Mr. Hey, Marlowe! Hey, hey! Those jerk California drivers! <laughs> the man behind the wheel. What about him? That thin-faced, blonde hair. I've seen him before. I know he was trying to hit one of us. Oh, fine. Well, that'll keep things from getting dull, won't it? Then... Then you're gonna help me. Well, now, look, I... <laughs> uh, who could resist you, baby? Okay, tonight I check in at the lodge at Sunland Sulphur Springs. Come on, let's get out of here. It was 8 o'clock and almost dark when I reached the foothills of the mountain range that separates the San Fernando Valley from L.A. proper and turned off onto a narrow dirt road that ran through a twisting gorge past a moon-faced watchman who asked no questions as he slowly opened a sagging wooden gate, faintly labeled... Sunland Sulphur Springs, where Mother Nature's remedies bubble from the earth private. It was another five minutes along the same dirt road uphill and through thick foliage before I was at a parking space out of my car and walking the last quarter of a mile toward the lodge itself that was spotted with widely separated cottages also sagging, and each tag casa, and followed by something Spanish and hard to pronounce. Inside the place was cheap porch furniture and occasional threadbare rugs over scarred pine and deserted except for a sleepy old guy with thick-lidded eyes and an accordion-wrinkled face who was slouched in a heap behind a sign on the reservation desk that read Maynard Sharp, no less, night manager. When I gave him my name and said that both my rheumatism and I needed a rest, he came too, almost. Uh, uh, Rume, eh, Mr. Marlowe. Hmm. Well, let's see. I can let you have most any one of the cottages. Half of them are empty. Things kind of slow this time of year. How slow can you get? You'd be surprised. Uh, how's about uh, Casa Francisco de Leon? Casa Francisco, hmm? Yeah, that'll be fine, Mr. Sharp. All righty, sir. Now, if you'll just sign the register here, I'll get your key. But uh, you As I signed my name, I checked the guest list quickly. And the next second found what I wanted. Deborah Jansen. And next to that, and in a different hand, a cottage for the night. Eh... Uh, Casa Rolando de uh, Baron Dido. That's close enough. Well, anyway, it was all I needed. I took the key from Mr. Sharp, a misnomer if ever you heard one, learned the location of my quarters, paid him in advance, and left. Outside, I turned to my right, past a large open bath that smelled like rotten eggs and talked to itself like a junior Vesuvius, as more warm sulfur water is equally unpleasant to smell, bubbled from a pipe in the center. Beyond that was the first cottage, 
Another cassa I couldn't pronounce, and it stayed like that all the way down the line until I reached the second one that showed light. It was the casa known as Rolando de Barandido. And when I moved closer and around to a window that was screen only, I knew that my client had done her eavesdropping well, because in the center of the room and putting on her coat was the ex-wife named Debbie, and standing nearby and holding on tight to the cigarette in his hand like it was support. Debbie, was what had Maury. to be the boyfriend, sure Eugene you know Maury. You're doing. You're, you're sure that Gaines will go through with this all right? For the hundredth time, Eugene, yes, I'm positive. Can't you understand? He has to. <clears throat> Besides, $20,000 won't break him. It won't more than bend him a bit. Now, stop worrying. But I can't. Debbie, wh why must you go alone? Now, why can't I go with you? Eugene, please, we've been over that. I told Leonard that I'd meet him in town at the Beverly Crest Hotel at 10 and alone. He agreed to also be alone, except for the money. Debbie, you do handle things well. Come here, darling. And a kiss for your brilliance. Oh, please, Eugene, there isn't time. Oh, what's the matter? Are my kisses losing their flavor at this point? Don't be a fool. Look, it's late, Eugene. It's after nine already. I've got to hurry. Now, go on. Go on, be a good boy and leave now. We shouldn't even be seen together tonight. Well, why not, Debbie? It's not smart. Here, meet me at the tulip room, darling, at 11 as we plan. Then, Eugene, we'll have time and reason to relax. 20,000 bucks worth of reason. As Maori oozed toward the door, I slid away from the cottage and into the shadow of a clump of trees nearby. Stayed there as he walked out of sight down the road that led back to the parking space. Then a few minutes later, when Debbie clicked off the light and left, I moved out of hiding and started slowly after her at a safe distance. Until from some place in the night, an ugly, snub-nosed automatic that belonged to someone blonde and thin-faced as a near-automobile accident stopped me cold. Where are you going, Jack? For air. I love to walk in the country at night, okay? I wouldn't know, Jack. I'm a city boy myself. But as long as that's what you want, it's Jake with me. As long as it's where it's good and dark. Now, go on. That way. Move. All right, Jack. That's far enough. Hold it. Turn around and face me. Why, so I can watch you pull the trigger? Never mind why, just turn. Okay, turn it is. That's better. Now, one step closer. One step closer. Hey, what's that? Now, pleasant, my friend, taking wing! <laughs> now, before I beat you in little pieces, let's have it. Who are you? Who do you work for and what do you want with me? Come on, gunman, talk! Okay. Okay, uh, no more. My name's Langley. Work for Earl Jennigan. Oh? Uh, yeah, I've been watching you ever since the trial started. Jennigan didn't want you moving in on it. Which is why you tried to pick me off with a car when I was with Gail Harper this afternoon, huh? Come on! Yeah, 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 yeah that's why. Now, now, what are you going to do with me? For the time being, Buster, leave you as is. Flat on your back, because I've still got to catch up with a lady before she reads a letter! <laughs> City boy. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... August 27th, 1949. Gerald Moore, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care. Especially now, with inflation the way it is, people are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch it's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in health care sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. You're listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now more, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, August 27th, 1949. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Eager Witness. It was
was strictly hit and run. I piled Langley into the manzanita and didn't even wait to see him bounce. Instead, I took off through a gully that was a shortcut to my car, because I knew that Jernigan's watchdog had nothing to offer compared with the hot-headed Debbie Jensen, who at the moment, no doubt, was well on her way to the Beverly Crest Hotel, and a blackmail rendezvous that was a cinch to wind up in the final destruction of the letter. That was my theory. But I dropped it like a hot rock just as I crossed the path to the sulfur pool. Mr. Marlowe! Mr. Marlowe! Somebody screamed! Yeah, in there by the spring! Oh, my gosh! Oh, my gosh! Sure, I had that. It was nothing but sulfur fumes and the thick gurgle of the springs until Sharp played his flashlight over the pool. Oh, my gosh! Oh, my gosh! And the water that was turning red from blood oozing around the knife in her look, back. Look! Look! It's Miss Jansen. Come on, Pop, give me a hand. Let's yeah. get her out of there. Yeah, Come I... on. <clears throat> Take it easy now. Take it easy. Ah, that's it. Debbie. I never should have tried it. Tried what, Bill? Who was it, Debbie? Who did this? He, he, he got the letter. Who? Who got the letter, Debbie? Debbie. Marlo, did she, did she pass out? A good minute. She's dead. Oh, uh... Well, she, she seemed to be mumbling something about a letter. Did you get what it was? The only part of it. A killer apparently took the letter away from her. Believe me, that's bad. Letter? What's a letter? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? Oh, it's probably that pheasant again. Letter? Pheasant? What are you talking about, Oh, son? I guess I'm just getting jumpy. Hey, hey, there is somebody. Come on, Pop. Sounds, sounds like he's over there, Marlo. Yeah, I can hear him. Oh, no, that, that ain't gonna do you any good, son. Not in that brush, it ain't. And what's more, I wouldn't go any further if I was you. But Pop, all he needs is ten seconds and he can destroy that letter for good. Well, just to see him, there's a million and one places a killer can hide in there and lay for you, son. Yeah. Yeah, Pop, well, it's the moment it's a stalemate. I'd sure love to find out who that snake in the bush is. You know... I've run a peaceful place up until it's getting to be like one of them there movies. <laughs> Only thing left out is a posse. Yeah, you're so right. Murders in the night, lost letters. It's corny enough without a posse. Yeah, and uh, my dangers, too. Hmm? Yeah, I see what you mean. Are you ready to... Uh, to... Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, uh, I'll lead you back to the office. My Jasper, I don't understand this one bit. Miss Jensen is stabbed to death over that letter, and in her dying... Hey! Huh? What is it? Shh. Up ahead there. Wait. Somebody duck behind that big tree. Keep the chatter going, man. Walk what? on up the path. Don't let him know we spotted him. Go on, talk, talk. Oh, wait, I, uh, okay, sure, sure. I was saying I don't understand. Well, our place here is generally as quiet as a tomb. As the old now, man grimly had led his way up the path, I followed a few feet behind. When he got even with the tree, I turned suddenly, took three fast steps, and grabbed him. Come here, you. Hang on to him, you. Hang on to him. Well, well. Mr. Leonard Gaines, the unimpeachable citizen himself, stand still, Gaines. Uh, uh, a gun? What's the idea, Marlowe? Try running and it'll come to you. I suppose you've got a legitimate reason for being here all thought up? I, I'm here because I, I've got a touch of arthritis. I need a treatment and a night's rest. Arthritis isn't all you're going to have if I find what I think I'm going to find in your pockets. Empty him, Buster. I'll I said empty him. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll empty them. That's better. A sharp... You're a witness, and I demand that you now, stop... Uh, just a minute, Mr. Gaines. You're in a pretty bad spot to demand anything. There. There's our baby. There's a letter we've been looking for. Pick it up, Gaines. Pick it up and read it. Now, now see here, my See Lord. there, Gaines. Read it while you're able to. Yeah. My dear Debbie, if I didn't know you so well, I'd resent your stupid accusations. Now, look, Mark. Read it. I... We've already made our property settlement, as you're well aware, and you'll be a long time... Finding a court that says otherwise. Now you know where you can go, so why not get started as ever, Leonard? Oh, fine. That's as about as incriminating as a lecture on the family meat bill. Sharp, whose jurisdiction are we under here? Uh, Jurors, uh, why, uh, county sheriff's office. All right, call him. Also, call your man out on the highway and have him lock that main gate. Main gate? Yeah. Say, now that's a good idea. I'll do it right now. now wait a minute, have you got a gun? Yep, got a rifle. Been in the family for years. Can you use it? Well, uh, yeah, I reckon I can. Well, uh, where are you going? Out to round up Langley. He'd be pushing hard to give his boss a star witness here a big helping hand. I want to be in shape to push back. And remember, Pop, uh. keep your eye on Gaines and not on the phone when you make those calls. I'll see you. Mm-hmm. 
The second time that night, I started down the hill and toward the car lot, keeping in the shadows and moving slowly this time. Because it was odds on that Langley had taken everything in. And I knew that he tried to part my hair with a gun barrel and pull Leonard Gaines out of the jam he was in the very first chance he had. So I stayed off the paths long enough to have both socks full of burrs when it happened. But not what I expected. It was the sharp family blunderbuss that had exploded with a blast like a small howitzer. So also for the second time, I turned and ran back up the hill, this time to the office. I got there just as Maynard climbing hand over hand up a smoking rifle barrel made it to his feet. Dead gum. Maynard! Maynard, what happened? Where's Gaines? Well, I, I, I don't know. It got away, I guess. Well, the shot. What about that? It went up there, through the roof. Oh, fine. Well, gosh, I, I, I didn't suspect a thing. He just said he wanted to smoke. But he didn't happen to have a match, I know. So you hung your rifle over your arm, stuck both hands in your pockets to find one for him, and that's when he took you. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Well, how'd you know? Never mind, pup. Well, I, 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 I made a grab for him, though. Uh, ripped his coat about halfway off. Oh, that's great. That's uh, great. Uh, well, I, I, I'm sure sorry he got away, Mark. All right, don't worry about it. Can't get far with the gate locked. Well, I, uh, I got bad news there, too. Oh, oh, the gate's locked all right. But uh, there's a back rod. There's a back what? Back rod. Rod, yeah, well, uh, right yeah. It ain't much. It's rough and rocky, but it's passable. August 27th, 1949, Gerald Moore and the Adventures of Philip Marlowe here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion next. Whether you're taking your pets on the road or a walk around the block, you need to be aware of heat stroke. Hi, I am Dr. Jose Arce, immediate past president of the American Veterinary Medical Association. It's important that pets get out and enjoy the warm weather and fresh air. But here are some reminders to help keep your pets safe in the heat. Tune into the day's forecast to see how hot it will be. Limit exercise on hot days or schedule walks earlier or later on the day when it's cooler. If outside, stay on the grass instead of the hot pavement. Make sure your pet has unlimited fresh water and access to shade. Never leave your pet in a closed vehicle and leave your pet at home in air conditioning when you go out. If you see signs of heat strokes in your pet, such as excessive panting, drooling, unsteadiness, or abnormal gum and tongue color, call your veterinarian or nearest emergency clinic. For more info on summer pet safety, visit avma.org. That's avma.org. Thank you for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, and now the conclusion of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Gerald Moore, August 27, 1949. And uh, anybody's been up here as often as Mr. Gaines has, sure know about it. Oh, great. Look, Pop, can't you understand that there was a murder committed here tonight and we had the yeah, murder but and no Marlo- buts? <sighs> Fell for the oldest gag in the world. But I was Marlo- a sucker to turn him over to you. And will you stop waving that envelope? I just think you ought to see this. All right, what is it? You, you... Oh. Where'd you get all that loot? Well, Gaines dropped it when I ripped his cot. Twenty grand, it says here on the wrapper. Something else written here, too. Casa Rolando de Bur- Barandito at ten. Casa Ro- Pop, that's it. That's the answer. Come on, we gotta get down that back road in a hurry. <laughs> Sharp at the wheel of the pickup truck, we bounced over the pair of sometimes parallel ruts studded with stones the size of bowling balls. It was called a back road. For the better part of two miles before he cut lights and motor and whispered that if Gaines was going to get stuck at all, it was sure to happen in a dry wash just around the next bend. I told him to wait and went ahead on foot. He was right. Gaines was stuck in more ways than one. His car was up to its hubcaps in sand and his wallet up to its stamp compartment in blackmail, conducted by his ex-wife's murderer with the same leather she'd had. A letter. It was Eugene Maury, and clenched in his hand was a tattered white envelope, nothing more. I'll make it easy for you. I held my thirty-eight in close my to my side and edged up behind them. Twenty thousand. Now, Maury, uh, I don't have that much. You liar. You're going to pay her that. I don't know. I know because we, we, we worked the deal out together. Only she got greedy. She tried to double-cross me and pull it alone. Uh, so you killed her? Yes, I, I didn't intend to, but when I found out that she tricked me, I, I was furious. <laughs> the first thing that I knew, I, I, I'd stabbed her. Yeah. That's enough of that. Just give me the money. You have nothing to worry about. Now, listen, Maury, I no, tell you, I... you listen, Gates. You're in no position to buy. It, it's better than having your $200,000 gambling debt exposed and your reputation ruined, isn't it? <laughs> or facing the trigger man, Langley, if you refuse to alibi for Jennigan, isn't it? Or bucking a perjury charge if you do alibi? Oh, no, no, no. You got yourself in the corner again, so pay off. It's only 20 grand. Well, I tell you, Maury, I don't have it. You're I lying again. Simply... No, he isn't. Oh, don't move. I don't want to be. 
Leave your hands where they are. I got the 20 grand right here, and it's pretty well earmarked as blackmail payment already. But just to round things out, Maury, I'll take that envelope you've got there. Yes, well, what do you want this for? Funny man. Because it's no doubt postmarked with an hour, a date, and a location. Which, together with Brother Gaines' own handwriting, places him out of town on July 30th. A time he swears he was at his Malibu home all day with Jernigan. Right, Gaines? Uh, smart boy, aren't you, Marlowe? You've still got a chance, Gaines. You'd better gamble with me. You've got nothing to lose now. Uh, I'm with you. Stand still, Buster. Or, sir, help me out. Now, Gaines, go! Go! Oh! oh, my leg! Were you thinking of going someplace, Mr. Gaines? Uh, no. No, I... I'm not going anyplace, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Well, Gail, the big show's about to start. Court will be in session in a few minutes. I know. And different from yesterday. Yeah. Oh, you did a swell job, Mr. Marlowe. Gee, gee, I don't know how to thank you. Save it, baby. If that scale Lady Justice holds in her hands isn't better balanced today, it was your hunch and old Maynard's blunderbuss did as much to put it there as my running around through the brush itself of springs. But all I knew was that Gaines was lying. I didn't know it was as complicated as it was. Well, that's because Debbie Jansen was twice as treacherous as we figured. I still don't understand. How did you know that Eugene Maury had killed Debbie? Well, you see, baby, I overheard her tell Maury that she was going to meet Gaines in the Beverly Crest Hotel at 10 for the payoff. Uh Uh-huh. But I figured that was a lie strictly for Maury's benefit when Pop gave me the packet of money Gaines had dropped. It had that complicated name of a cabin in the time of the appointment, which was also 10, written on it. Mm. So I knew the real meeting was scheduled to take place out there. See? Oh, I see. Then she was going to send Maury off to the Beverly Crest while she collected the money at Sulphur Springs and then beat it alone. That's it, honey. You see, if her cabin had been named something simple like uh, Number Four, then Gaines could have remembered it. Instead of that Casa Robino del Bangadoro, or <laughs> whatever it was, he had to write down, you see? Well, then things might have been different. Ah, oh, you'd have found a way. After all, you figured out it was the postmark that was important. Only after I'd been slapped in the face by a perfectly harmless letter with no envelope. Had to be the postmark. What else? Oh, they're starting. Yeah. Good luck, Mr. Marlowe. Give them the works. Don't worry, baby. I'm the eager witness today. We're going to knock them dead. Literally. <laughs> they got it coming. I watched Jernigan's face as the preliminaries got underway. The killer was beaten. When the court finally settled down to work and the prosecutor took over, I listened to his deft build-up as he primed the jury and the dramatic ringmaster voice he used when he called... Will Philip Marlowe take the stand, please? Now, Mr. Marlowe, you told us yesterday that you are a private investigator. Now will you tell the court in your own words what happened to you last night? I sat there looking into the cold, baleful eyes of the prosecutor and thought of a paraphrase on that wonderful quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes. It's not enough to ask for justice. One must also hope for mercy. Mr. Marlowe. Hmm? Oh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Well, it began here in this room yesterday afternoon at about 3.30 when the counsel for defense called a witness, a Mr. Leonard Gaines, to the stand. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joy Terry, John Daner, Michael Ann Barrett, Junius Matthews, Ben Wright, Lou Krugman, Larry Dobkin, and Bud Whittem. The special music is by Richard Orant. And from August 27th, 1949, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, an episode of the soap opera Claudia from August 27th, 1948. And now, Claudia. Claudia ought to be coming home any minute, wouldn't you say, Mother? I should think so. It's after six, but you know the theater. Clocks don't matter. I wonder how it's going. I've been wondering all day. Must have been a pretty exciting day for her. She's dreamed of it a long time, having a part in a professional play. I hope it's a good one. Uh, Say, am I acting like a stage mother? You are. (laughs) It's very becoming. It's almost worse than having a baby. I know what you mean. I do wish she'd come. 
There isn't even anything interesting to read in the papers. <laughs> you wouldn't know it if there were. <laughs> hey, Claudia, is that you? It is I, David, your own sweet wife. Uh-oh, the theater's got her already. Come on in here, darling, and give us your autograph. With pleasure, with pleasure. I'm just going to leave my pocketbook in the hall. How did it go, Claudia? I'm coming, I'll tell you everything. Well, go on, begin. We're all ears. How was it? David, you've forgotten something. So soon? You haven't kissed me alone. How can I forget to kiss my favorite actress? Come over here, Sarah Bernhardt. No, on second thought, Lillian Russell. Hmm? I don't want a stage kiss, either. Hmm. I want one just like that. Hello, Mama. I missed you all day. How are you? Bursting with curiosity. How did it go? You look all right. Didn't you miss me at all? Of course we did. Of course. Now tell us. What happened? David, was it roasting in New York? Who cares? I care. How you are is more important to me than any old play. Well, I are fine now. If you won't tell us how it went, we'll draw our own conclusion. Ooh. Must have gone well, Mrs. Brown, or she wouldn't be so concerned. Huh. She's going to be impossible from now on. I know it. You're right. It was wonderful. I actually got up on the stage and read my part. Well, what kind of part is it? I'm going to see the baby now. He's asleep. Did he take his orange juice all right? Well, fine. Now tell us. Can what... I see him? I won't wake him up. Please. Later, what kind of part have you? Well, I'm a young girl. Mm -hmm. The youngest sister of a very wealthy and attractive divorcee. Played by Victoria Manners, no doubt. Oh, she's beautiful. Horfritz and Bertha, did Fritz do anything about getting the call? No, not yet. And dinner, what about dinner? I, I, listen, I ought to go say hello to Bertha. Too. Claudia, stand still. Was Jim Barney pleased with you? Well, he, he seemed to be. Mama, listen, is the baby all right? That's a warm day. Now, stop worrying, darling. Everything is perfect. Uh, what did Jim Barney say? He said she was magnificent. Oh. oh I'd better be good. I'm going to be good in this part if it's the last thing I do. If you're not good in it, it probably will be the last thing you do. <laughs> I'll show you. Oh, David... Mama, you have no idea how exciting it was. Backstage, theater again. You'd think she'd spent the better part of her life in grease paint. You know, when I got on the stage today, I felt as if I had. It was the queerest thing. Maybe being married is what did it. Huh? Oh, David, I... I loved you more when I was standing on that stage kissing the leading man than I ever did before. Well, that's reassuring. How long till dinner, Mama? Kissing and dinner always in the same breath. Dinner is not for an hour yet. We weren't sure when you'd get home. Oh, or I'm starving. That gives you time to study your part. It's terribly important that you learn it by heart as soon as possible. You can't really act when you're holding a script in your hand. <laughs> you'd better get right down to your work. No, can't I see the baby? Do you want to be a success? You work. Oh. Do you have a lot to memorize? Pages and pages. Well, I couldn't do it. Of course you could. Memorizing's very easy. By the way, what's the name of this play? Um, it's, uh, called Summer Love. What is Summer Love? Summer Love is the play. I never heard of such a thing. Well, when you see the play, you will have. You see, it all takes place in the summer. Oh, oh that explains everything. It opens on a terrace. It's late afternoon. The sun's rays are slanting across the stage. They throw part of the terrace in shadow, see? It is a modern, obviously expensively decorated terrace. Uh, chair here, um, sofa over there, glass tabletop there. Anne Morris is discovered sitting in a blue glider, lower stage right. I'm Anne Morris. Are you going to do all of this out loud? Well, I have to get in the mood of it. Oh. <clears throat> Anne Morris is reading. But after a few minutes, she drops the magazine on her lap and dreams. We'll start dreaming. Hush up, Mama. You're not the director. For a moment, I forgot. Now, now I'm dreaming. Enter up stage left, Guy Fitzgerald. Handsome, debonair, 31-ish, wearing a well-cut tweed suit. Ah, uh -huh, that's me. Describes me to a T. He pauses. He looks it down. He starts to say something. Changes his mind, turns to go, and looks up. Sees him as he's about to leave through the French door, stage center, and speaks... Guy. Wonderful, wonderful. That's a marvelous reading. <laughs> wonderful. David, shut up. You make me self-conscious. But it was wonderful, really wonderful. It had real quality and timbre, didn't it, Mother? Let Feeling. her go on, David. All right, by all means, go on. Guy, there's no reason why we can't talk to each other, is there? Direct little girl, isn't she? A real huzzy. It's tight cast. Guy turns around, faces Anne for a moment, drops a cigarette, stamps it out with his foot. A man of few words. A strong, silent type. <laughs> and rather untidy. You're not angry with me, are you, Guy? 
She pauses. I'm sorry if what I said last night disturbed you, but don't be angry. It's terrible for two people to be angry with each other. Claudia will learn a great deal from doing this part, Mother. A great deal. Mm. Guy takes a few steps down towards stage right. He looks at Anne for a moment and he says, Here, Deb, you read this no, part. Look at Come on, come no, on, don't be shy. No, sir, no, sir, go oh, on. I'm not on. an actor now. Please, David. It'll make it much easier for me. Well, all right. Here, Just look, we, for you now. we can read the script together, see? Mm -hmm. All right, here I go. <clears throat> no, Anne, I am not angry. David, you're wonderful. <laughs> you should be an actor, too. Now, now go on, go on. Now, now read your line. Um, that's good. When you didn't speak to me, I thought you were. Hmm. I couldn't be angry with you. See, what's you know, I like the guy. Oh, pardon the pun. <laughs> this is me now. I'm glad. I never want to do anything that would make you angry with me. You never will. By the way, have you seen your sister? The cat. <laughs> Wait a minute now. Oh, oh, yes, I saw her. She came in from the pool. She went upstairs. Um, Andrew stayed center through French door. Stephanie, that's my sister. Come on, Mama. Come on, you read the part. I will not. Come, come on, on, don't come be shy. Oh, Listen, we no. won't criticize. Mama will give you a much better idea of what the play is about. Oh, but I don't want to read the it's part. It's not a matter of wanting. You're drafted, Mama, for drafted. Claudia State. Oh, <laughs> right. But just because my daughter wants to be an actress and make a fool of herself, I have to make a fool of myself. Here, here are the lines, Mama. Now, remember, you're Stephanie. That means 30-ish, sort of stunning, worldly. You know, you please all men. Well, this mm. should be fun. I'll give you your cue now. <laughs> she came in from the pool and went upstairs. No, I didn't. I'm right here. Hello, Guy, darling. Mama, you're stupendous. She's Bravo. She's not a Lynn Fontaine, No, David. no, no. More like uh, Greer Garth. Yes, oh, hush it. up. That's you're it. disturbing my train of thought. Where was I? <laughs> um, hello, Guy, darling. I'm so glad you have come back. <clears throat> you know, I wouldn't have stayed away, Stephanie. I couldn't stay away. That's the way I like to hear you talk, my great big man. Oh, darling, there is so much I have to tell you. Hmm? Anne, sweet, would you <laughs> mind? Yes, I would. I'd mind terribly. It's about time I had a chance to... At that moment, the upper stage left, and her Bridget, typical Bridget? Irish maid, about 30. Mrs. Norton, you're home. Arthur, you're just on time. <laughs> I am on time? Yes, we need a Bridget. You need a who? An Irish maid. Oh, uh, we do not need a maid around here. It is not too much work for me. <laughs> Claudia yes. needs you in the play now, Bertha. What? It's a part for you. Oh, I don't act. I just cook. You're acting now. Now, come on, come on, Bertha. Oh. Come over here. Hear your lines right here. But what goes on here? Now, don't ask. Just do as you're told. Oh, you're supposed no. to say, dinner is served. But dinner is not served. It is not served yet for well, half hour. Bertha, just say it, and with an Irish accent, Bertha. Oh, now you make fun. You're right. You're absolutely right. That's what theater is, making fun. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> so come on, now you're supposed to say dinner is served. Well, yeah, I, I say it. Good. It doesn't take much of an actress to say that. <laughs> uh, dinner is served. Oh, oh, yes. oh it's my line next. Um, thank you, Bridget. We'll be right in. At that moment, from downstage right... More people keep coming in. Enter Sir John St. Evans, a friend of Stephanie's who lives next door on the adjoining estate. Sir John says... Bertha, I have been oh, looking for... Oh, excuse me, please. I'm... Fritz, we were just going to get you. Here, you be Sir John. I be what? Uh, here's your part here. We're just rehearsing the new play I'm in. Oh, you're rehearsing a play? Yeah. Well, in the old country, I was a fine actor. Oh, Fritz, it's always bragging. Well, huh? was I not, Mama? Don't call me Mama in front of everybody. You better call her Bridget. That's her name now. Here are your lines, Fritz. They're British English. Oh, that's not so easy, but, but I try. Let's try. Stephanie, my lady. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not know you had other company. Come right in, Sir John. My sister and my fiancé are no company. Uh, uh, Dinner is served. Stephanie, yeah. my love, I didn't know you knew Sir John. She's known him, well, for a long time, Guy. Oh, yes, we had had many a jolly old time together. You have? It's not what you think, Guy. Uh, dinner is served? Good. Stephanie and Guy, Sir John, if you will excuse me, I'll go to my room. Go ahead, sweets. And exit center. That's all that's 
Well, well wait a minute. We can't stop right here in the middle now. Heavens, we can't. No. How are we going to know what happened? Right, oh, this is a very interesting play, yeah, Bertha? Uh, yeah. Well, what does it all mean, Fritz? Well, we will see. Now, come on, Mother, quick. Take your place. Guy, don't look at me like that. There's no point in going on. I'm not in this no, anymore. Hush up. Uh, how should I look at you, Stephanie? <laughs> Dinner is served. Oh, come now, old boy. It was nothing serious. Am I ever going to have a chance to work at my script? Oh, it is fun to be an actor. It is not work. Well, it is easier than cooking. <laughs> it comes very natural. To me. I think I'll call, call up Varney and apply for the job the first thing in the morning. But I, 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 I'm supposed to be the actress in the family. Well, we are trying to help. Yeah, to help you learn. <laughs> we all help you. And so you'll be big success and we'll be big oh, proud. You're <laughs> sweet, all of you. You're the most wonderful actors I've ever met. <laughs> and the most wonderful people, too. No wonder I'm so talented and so very happy. Here, here, a curtain speech. <laughs> and now... On with the rehearsal. Yeah, but Mrs. Norton, by now dinner is ready. And even actors have to eat. Whether you lunch alone or your noonday meal is shared with half a dozen others, ice-cold Coke is always a welcome addition, especially if you're eating out of doors picnic style. Get Coca-Cola by the case from your grocer or service station attendant, and there'll be enough on ice to enable you and your guests to lunch refreshed every day of the week. The rehearsal, it went good, yeah, Mr. King? Yeah, Fritz, it did. I like it. It is nice for all of us. Uh, Mrs. Norton, uh, she is an actress. Well, I'm glad you're all enjoying it so. I think she'd be fine actress if she is as talented at the theater as she is at home. Well, about that, we're going to find out pretty soon. Yeah, we all go to the theater. First thing on Monday, to eavesdrop on a rehearsal. Good. I will be there. Well, have a nice weekend, Mr. King. Same to you, Fritz, and many more of them. As I was about to say, every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again Monday at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. The parts of Claudia and David on this program were played by Catherine Bard and Paul Crabtree. From August 27th, 1948, Claudia on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you for making us a part of your day. Please thank this station and support their advertisers. It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite radio station. If you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single show. All of our shows are available through our webpage at classicradio.stream. That's classicradio.stream. You can stream our shows, learn more about classic radio collecting. You can find our social media links and our links to podcasts that have our shows available. Uh, You can contact me, and you can also buy me a copy to help us get new classic radio theater collections. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.